This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. If you enjoy Philosophy Bites, please support us. We're unfunded and all donations would be gratefully received. For more details, go to www.philosophybites.com. If we want to achieve a just society, one with fair and equal opportunity, should we be striving to reduce health inequalities? Of course we should. But how? As Harvard philosopher Norman Daniels explains, this isn't a simple matter. Health inequalities arise not just from unequal access to health care itself. Social status and wealth affect health too. Norman Daniels, welcome to Philosophy Bites. It's a pleasure to be here and I hope we have a good conversation. The topic we're focusing on today is the philosophy of health care. That sounds like an unusual topic for a philosopher to be interested in. How did you get into that? Well, uh, I can give you a somewhat autobiographical account, and it may not be a route that anyone else would follow. But I was trained as a philosopher of science, and the reason I went into philosophy of science was to learn more about theory acceptance. So it became interesting to me in the early 70s that several theories of justice were advanced. There was Rawls's theory in 1971, there was Nozick's reply in 1974, there was the dominant background of a utilitarian approach in many countries. So it seemed plausible to ask which theory is correct and how do we judge what's correct and would there be any evidence? So I somewhat naively thought that our agreement which was pretty hypothetical given that I was from the U.S. I was thinking about many of the European countries which agreed that health care ought to be distributed in a certain way to people. And I thought, well, let's see how the different theories approach that. Let's focus on John Rawls's theory of justice, which is probably the best-known approach to justice, certainly post-World War II. Could you just explain how Rawls approaches justice generally before we focus specifically on health? John Rawls is a contractarian, so his view is that we have to work out what count as fair terms of cooperation in a society. But we have to do so in a way from a position that isn't biased in favor of certain interests or features of people. So Rawls tried to design a system that would be neutral, and that was what was called his thick veil of ignorance. John Rawls asks us to imagine that we're behind this veil of ignorance, that we're trying to work out how society should be governed, and we're not aware of our race, we're not aware whether we're male or female, how much money we're earning, and so on. That's exactly right. So what principles would we agree to choose? And I emphasize that his veil was very thick. So we, in theory, don't know what we value as individuals, what our choices are. And so you might well ask, how could we decide what the best life would be for us, what principles we ought to adopt? Rawls had to develop a conception of goodness that was, as he described it, thin, not thick. A thin conception of goodness meant that he started to work with what he called primary social goods. And initially he thought these were things that anybody would want regardless of what else they wanted. Later, in his political version of his approach, he argued that these should be things that meet the needs of free and equal citizens. You can imagine that one really important characteristic that people would have in such a society would be their health. Yes, and in the early attempts to extend Rawls's theory, there were a number of people who thought, well, Rawls made a simple mistake and excluded health and health care from the category of primary social goods. My view was that you did a better job extending his theory with fewer modifications of the theory if you found room for institutions that promoted health within an existing good like opportunity. And so the extension I made of Rawls was to say that health is important because it makes a significant contribution to the range of opportunities open to people. 
people who are in ill health can't do as much of the kinds of things they would otherwise be able to do were they healthy. To get that clear, you're arguing that John Rawls claimed that behind this veil of ignorance, one thing that we would demand of this society would be equality of opportunity, and that we can't have equality of opportunity unless we have equality of health. Yes. So in his later work, he seemed to have embraced the idea that we would need institutions that would protect health in order to protect the range of liberties that his theory argued for and the opportunities that people have. So on his own extension of his theory, his view was that health was to be protected because of its contributions to liberty and opportunity. There's a difference between health and health care. One can provide free access to health care, but that won't necessarily provide equality of health for all sorts of reasons. Yes. One of the features of Rawls's theory was that it was developed in 1971, and this was prior to widespread awareness of the impact of social epidemiology on health. What we learned in the decades following Rawls is that not only does medical care and perhaps more importantly, public health measures contribute to the health of populations, but there are social phenomena such as the distribution of income and wealth which make a very significant contribution. One of the studies in the UK that helped establish this is the studies of the Whitehall workers that Michael Marmot was so prominent in developing. These are all people who have access to the National Health Service in the UK. They all have a basic level of literacy and education, and no one among them is among the deprived poor. And yet, if you look at their occupational status, the higher their occupational status, the longer and healthier their lives. This has been an interesting phenomenon that's been documented recently, that status seems to affect how healthy you are. Yes. So anyone who thought that all we had to do was provide for equal access to health care got the situation wrong because health care alone may make only a very small contribution towards the health of populations, and we need much more than that. We need not only broader public health measures, but I would argue we need the fair distribution of all the socially controllable factors that affect health, and that might include income and wealth, political participation rights, and various other of the goods that Rawls' principles happen to control. So the conclusion I've come to is that Rawls's theory happens to be a good description of what we should do to establish as equitable a distribution of health in a population as we can get. Does a Rawlsian model of society hold that health outcomes have to be equal within society? No. If you simply said uh, health outcomes have to be equal, then in a sense you would make health the tail that wags the dog of social justice. Rawls argued that there were allowable inequalities in a society, provided they were constrained by a principle that make the worst off as well off as possible. Even then, there would be some residual health inequalities if we think that social status or occupational status can determine health inequalities. But the question becomes, what then do you do about reducing those health inequalities and do you have any obligation to? And I think that's a question that's unanswered by the Rawlsian theory. But it seems to me that you're implying that if you adopt a Rawlsian model and you think that health is crucial to equality of opportunity, that we need to intervene in society to a much greater extent than we are to ensure that health is more equalised. 
Well, let me give one example. In the U.S., we've had a period of about 30 years in which income and wealth inequalities have significantly increased in the U.S., in large part because of the lack of redistribution from the wealth off to other parts of the population. If one were talking about intervening in society, that would be a starting point. What could be taken from the well-to-do classes, say the upper 1% that was singled out in our last election, and given to the rest of the 99% of the population? And what form should those redistributions take? It seems to me a more equal society would produce less health inequality, and that was what the difference principle was supposed to assure. There's a more basic question, which is, Equality for whom? Who is to count in this society? Because at least in America, you have millions of undocumented illegal immigrants, but in all societies there are illegal immigrants who can't access the health care of their societies. Should they have the right to health equality along with everybody else? You use the phrase right to health care, and I think that's fair, but I want to emphasize that On my view, a right to health care is derived from a right to fair equality of opportunity. So I would put the question in the following way. Do illegal immigrants, should they have access to fair treatment in a society which might include fair equality of opportunity? And I think it's an additional question within Rawlsian theory, what you would say about unauthorized immigrants. In a recent paper that uh, I did with a former student, Karen Ledeen, we argued that there were two grounds for including unauthorized immigrants in access to the recent efforts called the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare in the U.S., which was an attempt to provide something closer to universal coverage. The single largest group excluded from coverage are on authorized immigrants. So this is a poignant question for the U.S., but I think it has a global application. What we said is that long-standing unauthorized immigrants ought to be included. There are two arguments for granting health benefits to unauthorized immigrants. One is an argument from reciprocity. Many of these immigrants contribute work and taxes and contribute to the production of a good which is then distributed in the society. A more risky argument is that we should view long-standing unauthorized immigrants as members of the community. And then the argument is what should be owed as fair terms of cooperation to members of the community. And the argument there is that unauthorized immigrants, long-standing ones, are not only workers and taxpayers in society, but often belong to churches, send their children to schools, and are indistinguishable from other members of the community. Why would they not be treated and given fair terms of cooperation, which would include access to health care benefits? I'm intrigued by the role of a philosopher in these debates, because you're getting involved in specific public policy issues who to extend health care to and so on. Can a philosopher actually influence the debate, do you think? Yes and no. It depends on your time frame. My own experience is that it's very difficult for philosophers to influence social policy with regard to health. I have done a lot of work in developing countries and, for example, I have argued that we need a form of procedural justice to resolve a lot of disagreements that people may still have about how to allocate health care resources. I've encountered some willingness to introduce procedures in decision-making in some countries. The U.S. is not one of them. When I served on the Medicare Advisory Commission, 
and I still am officially a member of it, but I've never been asked to more than one episode. And that was when I sat in on decision-making about the use of a particular device, left ventricular assist device for destination therapy. This was a heart pump that could be partially implanted and used for people who were not candidates for heart transplants, but in congestive heart failure and who might live a few months longer at a huge cost. So I said, couldn't you take the resources and invest them in protecting the health of many more people from getting this form of congestive heart failure? And I was told that that question was out of order and that Medicare Coverage Advisory Commission was not engaged in looking at the opportunity costs of investments. So I think public system in the U.S. does not engage in the proper form of decision-making about what to cover, and that contributes significantly to the super-high costs of health care in the United States. A slightly depressing conclusion on which to end. Yes, it is. With the scare that was put into the hides of all the politicians about the U.S. engaging in anything like death panels, uh, according to Sarah Palin. The current debate in the U.S. has set back discussion of resource allocation by decades in the U.S. Norman Daniels, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your good questions. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us.